were you ready for or surprised by the the kind of overwhelming response that came after you published this study and after the documentary on on Netflix was released? Yeah, and timing is everything here. So I'll start out to say that when we started filming this and doing the study at the same time, it was kind of odd. We were dealing with things like Stanford, very protective of their brand. I wanted to make sure that there was nothing over my shoulder that said Stanford. They said, you can film on campus, but you know, be very careful. This is a Gardner study. This isn't a Stanford study. And the discussion started in 2021. We got the money in the start of 2022. We ran the study in winter and spring of there. And then we analyzed blood and poop for the rest of 2022. And at one point, the producer, Luis Sehoyo, said, oh yeah, we're gonna release this on January 1st. And I kind of thought it was January 1st, 2023. And then I had the realization that they then wanted all the film for a year to edit and it didn't release for another year. And I, I almost forgot about it in that time because it had been so long and we were very much working on the publication. Did you have to delay the publication? To no, not over? at all. No. So inside scoop, Stanford said when we started, said, is this legit? Is this like a publishable trial? And in real life, you can't know what's going to happen. If you didn't run the study yet, you didn't submit it. So I BSed and I said, of course this is, because I knew at some level I could submit it to a predatory journal if I had to at the last minute. What's a predatory journal? Well, you have to pay a lot of money and they don't really review it very well and they'll publish anything. <laughs> very discouraging how much mm -hmm. of that there is out there. That doesn't seem like the path that an esteemed scientist would take. But I had to give them this answer, like they wouldn't let them on campus to film unless I promised it would be published. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't understand this world, it, it doesn't work that way. What if nobody signed up and nobody came to the study? And so this is before doing anything, but all of my work has been published in 30 years. So we said yes. And it, to be honest, it's not a rocket science design. It's pretty standard design for me. Probably not the best study I ever did, but we submitted it to JAMA Network Open. Which is not a predatory journal. Very high end journal. I kind of thought we'll get some good feedback and then if they reject it, we'll go here and they took it. And back and forth always takes longer than you think, ends up being published on November 30th, a month before Netflix comes out. Planned? Not at all planned. Just sort of serendipity that it comes out. Survives on its own actually had a huge altmetric score. Do your listeners know what an altmetric score is? Let's Do you it. know what an yeah. altmetric score is? Let's unpack it. So for me as a faculty member, my currency is who cite, what other scientists cite my work. And that takes years. So if you look at some of my best work, you don't really know till five years out to see how many people cited it. An altmetric score is more of a traditional and social media score. So it's tracking how often it's in the WAPO, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, as well as Facebook, Twitter, Twitter. Instagram, all those things. Or and X, so, we should call it. Uh, I don't call it X. <laughs> I call it Twitter. I refuse. Uh, and so, you know, instantly, you know, within a month, what this altmetric score is. And the altmetric score went through the roof. It's over 2,000 right now. 20 is considered a good score. Um, so it took off. But this is just the journal article. So for a month, I uh, got a lot of love for that. I got a little pushback uh, on some of the design features, which, was, which always happens. In fact, I hope we get to it. But I had a great uh, tutorial. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get into that because I think, you know, I've shared some blogs from folks like Peter Atiyah that have commented on the design. I want to unpack that but the design before the film came out. So it was sort of like the, this huge mass media thing for a month and it was just tapering down and then Netflix came out and then it just bumped over the moon. I was surprised. Why do you think that was the response? Is it because it just played you know, nicely into the, the diet tribe conversation? Uh, you know, so I got, uh, somebody forwarded me a tweet from an investigator, I can't remember where she was before, but she's at Harvard now. And she was uh, partly responsible for releasing the Moderna vaccine. And she released this really nice tweet saying, this is some of the best science communication 
I have ever seen. And the reason it was so good is because viewers didn't understand that they were getting science communication. It was entertaining and engaging. And she went on in a mini little tutorial to suggest that she wished they had done something like that for the vaccine. There was a lot of misunderstanding. And if they had just communicated that in a more engaging way, that would have worked. And that's what Louis did. He took this science and he made it very engaging and fun. It was number three on Netflix for two weeks. And it was at its basis science, but he put so much more into it to make it accessible to people. And so in reflection, do you feel like on the aggregate, on the net, the response has been largely positive and, and the negative sort of critiques are few and far between, but maybe from some individuals that people would say are quite influential in this space? Yeah, there, there's some definite influencers that critiqued it, but the overwhelming positive response I got makes those negative critiques a rounding error to me. I got love from all over the world for months, friends, neighbors, family, complete strangers who were impacted by that Netflix. That is the most impactful thing I have ever done in my career in a positive way. Wow. That must feel pretty good. It feels really good. I am, have this kind of conflicted uh, position here. So if I, if I speak to an academic about this study, most of the time uh, the conversation is very similar. They understand the study, what it shows, maybe what it doesn't show, uh, how to interpret it, how not to overinterpret it, and it doesn't seem that controversial. <laughs> but then if I speak to a friend that doesn't have a science background, they feel a little confused. Hmm. And I kind of, to a degree, I can empathize with them. So I want to read out a couple of things to, to illustrate this. So this, this is a blog. This is on Netflix's blog, right? Yeah. They did a blog, and I appreciate the documentary is separate to the study, right? Let's, let's yes. clarify that. Agreed. Yep. There's a quote here that says, the study found that after only eight weeks, the twins eating the plant-based diet experienced an increase in their life expectancy, reduced visceral fat, the dangerous fat that accumulates around your organs, reduced risk of heart disease, and even a heightened sexual drive. The results surprised even the Stanford research team. So that's on, on Netflix's blog. Are we, is all of that accurate? I've, I never heard that blog, but you'd have to di deep dive into those results to see what that was. I'm sort of hanging my head over the sexual drive thing. It's a ridiculous. Uh, the body fat thing, I hope we get into that. It's not even part of the study. So that's an exaggeration of what we're, right. that's not, a lot of that isn't even part of the study. What about increase in their life expectancy? Yeah, that is super cool, biological clock, epigenetics, super preliminary. Okay. Doesn't really show anything for certain. So someone kind of reads that and then they read this from Peter Atia on his blog maybe even in the same day. Ready. And he says, perhaps this chaotic three-ring circus or a, a docu-series serves to highlight the nonsense of the study itself. And for those of us for whom health is our top dietary concern, this research, in quotation marks, should be taken for just what it is, entertainment, not rigorous science. So these are two distinctly different <laughs> takes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and... And so my understanding is that when people are exposed to these two different takes, they either do nothing or they say, in this case, I'm trusting Peter because he's a smart guy yeah. and, and documentaries are likely to, to be biased, kind of telling a story. Fair. And I should respond to that. Yeah. You ready? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, tell, uh, when you hear that, tell me uh, how you feel. Yeah. So if you get this much of a viewership for something like that, there's, there's almost like there's a target on your back for sure. And these are, this is not trivial. This is ways of eating. Everyone eats. There's a lot of vested interest in this. Um, it is a chance for an influencer to critique something and, and trash talk it and I assume gain influence. But at its core, the study was a decent study. It wasn't the best study I've ever done. But 
I've been doing this for 30 years. And one of the challenges of it is science communication. So is this just gonna be fellow scholars? Is this gonna be physicians in change practice? Is this gonna be the average person who views this? And all of those are, are really challenging to try to put into one study and one set of information. And at the end of the day, I'm kind of looking at the flip side of this is, how much health information has come from the cattlemen's industry and the egg and the poultry and the Frito-Lay? And the, I mean, there's, there's tons of messaging out there kind of in the opposite direction. And so just even dabbling in this and seeing what it would be like to move past the research conference and past the colleagues, this is fa absolutely fascinating and intriguing to think of this opportunity to reach more people and sure, it will have some misunderstanding and some downsides, but it's been really exciting. Right, so you were ready for some of this critique? Oh, it had to be. It was like, a, yeah, if you're going to expose this science to so many people, and so many people think diet is contentious, and I want to thank you for what you've done with nutrition science. Uh, I think much like the episode I did that was pegged as a debate with Stu Phillips, mm. That was a fun episode. It was a really fun episode. And I think what was fabulous was sort of having both people at the table at the same time. There had been a tweet at one point that looked controversial. I think it and, was said at the top of great debate. Yeah. <laughs> and as soon as we exchanged an email or two, it was like, we agree about almost everything. And there's a couple things we disagree upon. And it's obviously the contention and the disagreement is more exciting than just two people yeah, you should eat vegetables and you should exercise. Yeah, everybody agrees on that. That's pretty boring. Can we find something that they disagree on is more exciting? But my experience has been, so I've worked with the American Heart Association, the American Diabetes Association. I'm on the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. When you get a bunch of scientists in the room and the data are in front of you, there's very little disagreement. We rarely have all the information to definitively and unequivocally say, this is the thing you should eat or avoid. That is rare. And so when you have inadequate evidence, you have to put together all the evidence you do have. It's not like you don't have any, you have a bunch. There's some animal model study, there's some observational epi, there's a Kevin Hall study that was really well controlled, but only for 20 people for two weeks. And you have a gardener study that was 50 or 100 or 600 people for a couple of months or a year. If you put all that on the table, people are likely to be able to, scientists are likely to say, yeah, we all kind of agree that this is probably the thing and the strength of the evidence is this level and more studies are needed. It's so frustrating at the end of almost every discussion, more studies are needed, but people have to eat today and tomorrow so we make recommendations for today and tomorrow based on what we know yeah i think we may have touched on this in our last episode that if you're on the outside you might think that everyone just disagrees with one another there there's there's no consensus position um, you may as well just eat however you like yeah that That's hurts a, that hurts yeah there's so much more consensus than that it's ridiculous if peter and i peter t and i were at the same table we would agree on almost everything, to be honest. I know that you've collaborated with Peter before, I think, in Diet Fits. Is that right? We did, and it was very frustrating that he didn't call me about some of his concerns. I worked with him for years. Right. Yeah, I thought when I read that, given the history with Diet Fits, I, I wondered, like, do you take that feedback from someone like him personally when they say, you know, the work you've just done, it's entertainment, it's not science? Yeah, that, that hurt more than almost all the other critiques just because it would have been so easy to pick up the phone and said, Christopher, I can't believe you did this thing. And if I had just had one minute, I would have said, you know what? I didn't do that thing. That was in the movie, not in the study. And that was a fallout. And I don't have control over the movie, but damn, that movie got a lot of attention. That was pretty fun, Peter. Yeah, I was surprised he, he didn't have you on his show, but maybe he will. 
still time. I'm, I'm open. I recently ran my full labs through Function Health. And I have to say the results were eye-opening. Turns out my ApoB was higher than ideal, probably thanks to a little too much coconut yogurt. I also found out I was slightly low in copper, something that I would have never suspected without testing. On the flip side, my biological age came back 13.3 years younger than my actual age, a calculation based on the work of aging researcher, Dr. Morgan Levine. So all in all, I've got a few tweaks to make to optimize my lipids and nutrient status, but overall my blood work says I'm doing pretty well. That's what I love about function. You get access to over 160 biomarkers covering everything from hormones and inflammation to nutrients, toxins, cardiovascular risk, and more. And all your results are housed in one beautiful platform, all tracked over time. Once you get your results, you can make informed changes before small issues become big ones. To get started, head to functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill. The first 1000 people get a $100 credit toward their membership. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill.